I remind us all that um, we at Hope Community Church are not about a worship service. We're not about a sermon. We're not about a personality, a pastor, a leader. We're not about an event or programs. We're all about being internally strong and externally focused. We're all about knowing Jesus and helping other people come to know Jesus. That is what we're about. This morning has been a sweet time together worshiping Jesus. That helps us to orient our heart towards him, to become internally strong. We've also heard story, testimony of what God is doing in our lives as a body. And one of the things about gathering together as a body in a worship service is we can encourage each other by sharing our story. God is at work in us, individually and corporately, making us stronger as we're becoming more like Jesus and using us in our community helping other people know who Jesus is. And so I thank our worship team this morning and everyone who shared for reminding us of that as we expressed to Jesus our affection to him and for him and what he's done in our lives. Um, So uh, one of the things that we do on Sunday mornings is we have opportunities for our kids to learn and grow at their appropriate age environment. We're going to let you guys head on out. There are big people who are adult teachers and leaders who will um, guide you. So for those of you who are fairly new to Hope, just kind of follow the crowd. While they're headed out, I'm going to invite up uh, Rachel Forgotch. Um, And um, Steve, if you would just go to the first slide in the PowerPoint, which shows this symphony. Uh, We began a new series last week See the title of it, Doing What God Made You to Do. And uh, part of what this series is about is helping us as members of the body of Christ to uh, identify where it is that God has gifted us and prepared us to serve. Um, And so Rachel, would you maybe come on over here? The camera's right here. So yeah, there's people joining us online. Um, So uh, Rachel, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are, your family, uh, maybe a little bit about what you do, how long you've been connected here at Hope. Sure. Um, I'm Rachel Forgotch, and I live with my husband and my dog in Elizabethtown. I'm a fourth grade teacher in the Lebanon School District, um, and we've been in um, Mount Joy, E-Town, for a couple years now, um, but we took a break from coming in person um, during COVID and worshiped online, um, and so have connected back this summer. Um, yeah. Very cool. And you've connected back and have jumped into serving yeah. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the life of our church. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I spend um, some time on Sunday mornings with Kingdom Kids as one of the fourth and fifth grade um, teachers. And I also um, help with Awana on Wednesday nights with the Cubbies group. Wow. So you really jumped in. I did, yeah. Not, not just one place, yeah. but two places. Yeah. And why? Wait, what motive, like deep, deep down inside, why did you do that? Yeah. Uh, well, looking back, um, I can see the impact that my Sunday school teachers had on my life. Mm. Um, and I'm really thankful for the truths that they poured out in me week after week after week. Um, but when I came back in person, um, I saw all, all of the needs. You know, there were a mm. lot of needs to serve. Um, but for me, I, I gave myself a lot of outs. Um, Hmm. I said, well, I'm not that connected at Hope. Hmm. Um, I don't know that many people, so somebody Hmm. else will do it. Mm -hmm. Um, But God kind of used this summer um, and some different situations in my life to really kind of draw me closer to him Hmm. um, and kind of put a tug on my heart to um, not only get connected, but to kind of serve in different ways. Hmm. And um, even after I saw, you know, the announcements week after week, I, I still was like, well, I'm just going to pump the brakes. I'm not going to. Somebody uh-huh. else will do it. Um, uh-huh. But God kept kind of tugging a little harder. And um, I'm really thankful that I committed and said yes and um, counted a privilege to kind of serve in these different ways. 
T- tell, us, tell, tell us about that. Like, you counted a privilege to serve. What, like, what's taking place inside of you because you're yeah. investing, because you're serving in this way? Yeah. Um, it's interesting that the lessons that we teach and we prepare are for, you know, um, for the children, but they really are um, being used in my life. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's always interesting to me, the lessons week by week that are already planned out. Um, God knows, and he um, knows exactly what I need. And so those lessons that I teach with the children, um, they're used in my heart, um, lessons that I need to be reminded of or truths that I need to be um, reminded of. Um, he's using as I am, you know, working with the, with the fourth and fifth graders. Um, and I'm also just encouraged by their faith and the things that they share and the way that they pray for others and their their love for each other and their love for God. That's also just really encouraging to me. Would you, would you recommend that people check out serving this way? Yes, I would. And I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, hmm. I, I feel um, very fortunate, just even with um, connections that I've made. You know, it's one way that I've also been able to kind of connect and get to know others here at Hope um, in a way that I probably wouldn't have before. So, hmm. yes, definitely. So if somebody wanted to do that, what, what do they do? How do they do that? Sure. If you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. But um, um, definitely contact Miss Becky. She's phenomenal. She does a wonderful job just making sure everything is um, ready to go each week. Um, so, yeah, contact Becky. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you for investing in our kids. I mean, it's making a huge difference. Um, and... Uh, Thank you for being willing to, uh, to share your story here on Sunday morning. Give her a hand. <clears throat> so um, during this series, oh, well, before I go on, I should just say this. Uh, um, we're, you know, we're, we're missing like about 60 people today. We're not missing them. They are away. And those 60 people are, oh, I don't know, about 40 or so of our students, 7th through 12th grade, along with probably 15 to 20 adult leaders who are, ah, they're 35 minutes away up at uh, Refreshing Mountain Camp, and they've had a weekend winter retreat together, um, building relationship, having fun, learning, growing. Um, So anyways, just um, thanks to uh, all those who invest in our kids in that way, our, our, our students. Um, so throughout the, uh, the past couple of weeks, I've been reading this book entitled The Person Called You. Um, you know, we're in this series, Doing What God Made You to Do, and this book talks about that. Um, and one of the things that Bill Hendricks uh, um, begins with, with sharing is some stories and some things that he's been learning from uh, Warren Buffett, the life of Warren Buffett, uh, worth uh, $62 billion, company worth 250 some billion dollars, the ninth largest company in the world. Um, but um, Buffett... Uh, um, he has an interesting upbringing. This book, The, the Snowball, uh, Warren Buffett and the Business of His Life, Hendrix um, has, has been learning and growing from. And he, um, he tells the stories about Warren Buffett. He says that when, when Buffett was just a little guy, when he would gather in worship, so apparently he was somebody who showed up on Sunday mornings, had that kind of a Christian background, no idea where he's at in his faith. But when he was a young kid, um, he tells stories of being bored in worship services. Kind of understandable. I remember that, right? Being bored in worship services. So what he would do to entertain himself would be to take the hymnal out and to look at the ages of the composers of the hymnals when they were born and when they when they died, and he would calculate life expectancy composer after composer after composer, and he kind of determined as a young kid, it was good to live a long life. Um, He also talks about when he was a young kid, uh, he would hang out at a friend's house, and they would sit in the front porch, and they would watch cars go by, and he would record the license plates, numbers, and letters of cars. Why? Because he had this interest in numbers and letters and how frequently they would appear. And so he would um, calculate how often certain numbers and certain letters appeared. 
when he was just six or seven years old, he was selling gum by a pack of five sticks in his neighborhood. Then he graduated to selling six packs of, uh, or um, purchasing six packs of Coca-Cola and then selling them individually. So he'd buy a six pack for 25 cents and sell each bottle for a 20% profit. When he was 10 years old, it was the tradition in his family for dad to take you when you turn 10 to the East Coast to do whatever it is that you wanted to go. Or, uh, go wherever, whatever city you wanted to see and whatever, um, whatever you want to do in that city. He chose New York City. Why? He wanted to go to the, to this, the Stamp and Coin um, Museum there and he wanted to go to the New York Stock Exchange. 10 years old! Shortly after that, he got a hold of a, a book out of the library, 1,000 Ways to Earn $1,000. And he became uh, fascinated with the book, in particular the concept of, of compounding, compounding numbers. And he could visually see in his mind's eye how as a kid rolling a snowball through the snow and it getting bigger and bigger, thus the title of the book, The Snowball. He was fascinated with how numbers could compound. Hendrix, after telling these interesting vignettes, painting this story of the life of, of, um, of Warren Buffett, goes on and, and he says this. He says, you can see a consistent pattern through Warren Buffett's life. I think we have it on the slide here. Um, from childhood to the present, he keeps using certain abilities, like analyzing assessing worth and recognizing patterns and anomalies. He keeps working with certain subject matter, like numbers, the concept of compounding and business information. From all of this, we can see a unique pattern of behavior and motivation. That pattern began in childhood and has remained consistent throughout his life. And then he makes this statement. Hendrix says this. He says, here's what's important. Every person, that means you and I, Every person has their unique pattern of behavior and motivation. And that pattern begins in childhood and remains consistent throughout their life. Others may have similar patterns, but no, no two people have exactly the same pattern. Fascinating. It's a fascinating conclusions that you and I have a unique pattern of behavior and motivation, and that pattern is rooted deeply in us, inside of us. It's been there our entire life. While we were growing, um, while we've grown older, it hasn't, we haven't outgrown that unique pattern and identity of who we are. We can't get rid of it. We can't change it. We can't make it anything different than what it is. It's like our fingerprints. It's how God made us. And so we're in this series, right? Doing what it is that God made you to do. And the question that we're going to look at this morning is, what purpose, what is my specific purpose purpose? How is it that God has made me to accomplish the purpose that he has for me? You see, we've been saying in this series that you can't do anything you want to do. You can only do what it is that God made you to do. And God made you on purpose, and he made you with a purpose. Every one of us have been made with a purpose, a unique purpose, like our fingerprints. Now, last week we looked at Psalm 139. This morning, James read from a large portion of that, and we're going to continue to dig into actually reflecting on reading the same verses that we read last week, but digging deeper into some that we hadn't spent as much time on. So Psalm 139, verse 13, understanding that you have been made with a purpose. You have a purpose, and do you know that purpose? So David continues and he writes, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you 
because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Last week, we dug into that phrase, all the days ordained for me. And we saw that God has a macro purpose and a micro purpose for our lives. That God, in his macro purpose for our lives, is for us to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. This is God's ultimate goal. And then a micro purpose and that he fashioned and he formed us as a potter takes a piece of clay and fashions and forms it according to how he determines and decides. And she may want that clay to become a platter or she may want that clay to be a pitcher. Whatever it is, the potter shapes it. It's the potter who makes it to accomplish a purpose. Today we're going to look at verse 13 and verse 15 in which we see that God has made us with a very specific purpose. He says, for you, verse 13, created my inmost being. I want us to pay attention to the verbs. They're highlighted here. They're all linked. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together. You see, you can't do whatever you want to do. You can only do what God made you to do. God is the one who is knitting. God is the one creating. God is the one making. God is the one weaving. You can't do whatever you want to do. You can only do what he made you to do, and he made you with a purpose. He made you with a purpose. You see, from the psalmist's viewpoint, God's role in your formation is undeniable, right? Look at the emphasis on you. You're the one who did it, God. You're the one who did it, God. You're the one who made me, God. It's your hand shaping and making me. I can't do whatever I want. God did something. He made me a particular way and for a particular purpose. You see, it wasn't chance, it wasn't mistake, it wasn't circumstantial that you came into the world. The circumstances by which you came into the world may have been unfortunate, they may have been the result of an evil act, they may have been unintended. But those circumstances didn't make you, God made you. The circumstances didn't make you. God made you. Those circumstances could have been tweaked and changed and all kinds of things could have happened. So much so that that sperm and egg would have never produced the human life that you are. It could have been spontaneously aborted. Could have been aborted. But God was over it all, knitting you together. It wasn't chance, it wasn't mistake, it wasn't circumstantial. It was God who wove you together. And he did it over and above all that natural process and the way that the DNA is, is, is trans, transferred and, and whatever the complexity that science has been able to look at and to uncover and discover, God was over that. 
superseding your design, even allowing, somehow even allowing the brokenness of the world, and the brokenness of the way that the world is, to be woven into your DNA, a missing chromosome, a missing finger, a missing this, a missing that. And even a broken spirit. In Psalm 51, David reminds us over there that even from that moment in which we were conceived, we were in sin. Somehow, in spite of the effects of sin and sin itself, God is over it. And some of us have had many unfortunate circumstances in life. Don't allow the lie of the evil one to say that you're junk, that you're a mistake, that you were unintended, because God has brought you here. The psalmist is clear. It is God. It is God creating, knitting, weaving, and making. It is God. God loves you, and God has a plan for you. It's not by mistake that any of us are here. It's not by mistake that any of us are here in 2021, now 2022. It's not by mistake. God made us on purpose. Now, these verbs tell us something that are worth us investigating. The first verb that we read there is the verb to, um, to create, right? You created my inmost being. And I, and I did some word search this past week, and, and uh, the word create that we see translated in the English, in the Hebrew means to create. Oh, isn't that quite profound? But it also has a, a little more nuance to it. It means to bring forth. It's this idea to create an object out of a similar kind. It's a figurative extension of giving birth to a baby, bringing forth a new life. God has brought forth your inmost being. He had you in mind before the world was created. And he's bringing forth your inmost being in the moment in which the egg and the sperm are being united. He's in it, bringing forth your inmost being. That second word, knitting together. Meaning to, to grow or to form or to knit together. It's, it's um, an, for example, it's to cause a biological body to form and to grow. It's, it has a, a focus on the structure of the body. It's a figurative extension of weaving together a piece of cloth with yarn or thread. My daughter knits. She takes different colors of yarn, too, and she makes scarves and sweaters and hats and gloves. And she takes from these separate pieces, these strands of separate bits of cloth or fibers that have been woven, and she weaves them and knits them together and makes something out of them. And here the psalmist says that you have been taken like these threads by God, the threads of your identity, the threads that make up your inmost being, and he's woven them together. It's a fascinating picture. When you think of the idea of a, somebody sitting there knitting and then weaving, Right, That's the next word, and we are woven. He's woven us together inside the deep, dark places of the womb. And that word, to weave, it means to weave, I don't even know if I can say this right, variegated, is that the right way to say that word? I've never heard of the word. I had to look it up in the English dictionary. What is variegated or variegated cloth? Variegated, having streaks or marks or patches of different color or colors, kind of like my shirt, right? It's got all these spots and spotches and there's multiple colors. It's the idea of taking several pieces of things that are multicolored and weaving them together. And this is what God has done with you and with me. He's created, he's knitted together, he's woven together. And what has he been creating and what has he been knitting and what has he been weaving together? Two words, two words the text 
gives us. The first one is, he's been creating and weaving your inmost being together. Your inmost being. Well, what is your inmost being? Well, well, that's an interesting Hebrew word. It means kidney or an organ of the body. Some translations say heart. It's this idea of the, the central core piece of who you are as a human being. It's also used to refer to a kernel or, you know, a grain of wheat. It's also used or translated as inmost being. Heart, mind, spirit of a man is the core of the inner person. It's the seed of emotion and affections. It's the origins of desire, affections, and passions. God has knit together, woven together your inmost being, your inmost being, the central core of who you are as a person. And then secondly, what else has he been knitting and weaving and creating? It's your frame. He says, my frame, my frame was woven together in the dark places, right? My frame was created, and this frame is the skeletal framework. It's the bones. It's the physical makeup of the human body with a focus on the bones as, as, as central and the inter, in, intermost part. And so we get the sense that, that God... At work before all of creation and at work in the moment of your conception was weaving and knitting and bringing together the threads of your identity, both of your physical and your external appearance as well as your immaterial, spiritual part of who you are. And God wove together, knit together, created a body and a spirit on purpose, for purpose. God is this master craftsman making you, making me exactly who he wanted you and me to be. And he didn't make any one of us the same. Every one of us is unique and different. We're going to spend the rest of our time asking this question, what exactly is my inmost being? My inmost being, as you see on the side screens, is the, this is, this, is, this is what I could come up with. From all of my research, from all of the commentaries that I, that I researched, from the, the word definitions, my inmost being is the innermost recesses of our being. It's the seat of consciousness. My inmost being is the executive center of me as a person. My inmost being is the place where decisions and choices are made. My inmost being is that part of me that is spiritual, not material. The inmost being is the place of my desires, my affections, and my passions. My inmost being, well, it's everything that makes me me. <laughs> hey, I, I couldn't figure out any other way to say it. It's just everything that makes me me. It's everything that makes you you. And God created that everything that makes you, you. And that everything that makes me, me. He knit and wove on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose. All of those intricate details that make you, you. God made your inmost being. Now, the deeper question, of course, is, well, then what in the world is my inmost being? What's in my inmost being? What's in there? And this gets a little bit more complicated, and this is where I, I must diverge from explaining the biblical text and into beginning to look around at other avenues to attempt to explain what is in me. What is the, in, the inmost being part of me? How do we uncover and discover that? I'm going to give us a definition, and then I'm going to explain how I got to that definition. But our inmost being, your inmost being is the immaterial, spiritual part of you that contains the multifaceted set of strengths, abilities, gifts, passions, and personality traits that instinctively and consistently you function out of in doing whatever it is that you do. And when you function out of these traits, you are most satisfied and productive. So we might say that 
God made us with a purpose, and that purpose that he made me with is rooted in my personality, my passion, my strengths, my abilities, my gifts. This is my inmost being, thus my purpose that God has made me with. So where, how, did I, how did I arrive at, at this? Well, it is interesting to look at Scripture. You can, you can begin to identify that in Scripture you see multiple kinds of people behaving and acting in different things and around what behavioral science has helped us to see our strengths and abilities and gifts and passions and personality traits, right? It's the behavioral sciences that have given us this language. Behavioral sciences are simply those that study and research and look at people, right, and look at the way that people interact and relate with each other. Behavioral scientists help us to understand that when we function out of these things, we feel strong on the inside. We're, we're happy. We're satisfied. We're, we feel this sense of, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. It's this kind of thing that led Eric Little, that um, amazing Olympic runner, to say this. He says, I know that God made me for a purpose. And then he says this, and he also made me fast. And the famous line, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Something about Eric Little's understanding of how it is that God made him, him in his inmost being and in his external being, his frame, so that he could run fast. And when he did that, he sensed the satisfaction of God in his life. The behavioral sciences have worked long and hard at helping us to look at people and the way that they interact and work. And, and today we're just going to look at two things, passion and personality. And next week we're going to dig into the gifts and abilities and things that make me, the other things that make me um, strong on the inside, strengths. But today, passion and personality, and we'll just start with that, that, that first one, passion, and, and we see that passion is a God-given desire that compels you to make a difference. This is, this is how passion's been, def been defined. God-given desire that compels you to make a difference. And then, and then as I thought about that definition, I'm like, can, you know, okay, so this is, this is the behavioral science that's giving us, can we see this reflected in Scripture anywhere? I began to think of biblical characters and the ways that they functioned and the kinds of things that they did and how they were motivated because passion, that's what passion says, right? Is there something inside of me that motivates me? I'm passionate about it, so I go and do it. And you think about Nehemiah. And you go to, go to the story of Nehemiah, chapter 1 and 2, and Nehemiah was deeply passionate about seeing the people of God return to the city of Jerusalem. He was broken so much so that he wept before God. And he took great risks out of this passion. It was this passion that drove him. Great risks to approach the king and to ask the king for all kinds of favor. It was this passion that motivated him to go and do something. There was something stirring in him. Martha. Martha driven, motivated to care and meet the needs. We see this repeatedly when we identify and see Martha. She's always about being out there in front, accomplishing and doing. Barnabas. Barnabas, he's that interesting biblical character who gets called the one who's the encourager. He, he seemed to be passionate about investing in people, raising people up, willing to take risks on people who came up short. Think about the Apostle Paul. Over and over and over, he says, I have been appointed to take the gospel, the good news, to the Gentiles. And this past week, I'm reading in Ephesians chapter 3, and, and I was reflecting on how he says, I am, I am, like, I'm not even worthy among all believers, let alone the apostles, to be given this privilege. But this is what God has called me to do. He's passionate about taking the gospel to the Gentiles, and he's passionate about doctrine, defending doctrine, making sure people understand clearly, here's, 
here's what you should believe, and here's what's false. Just throughout his epistles, his passion is obvious. James, if you read the book of James, many people love to read the book of James because it's so practical, right? It's so helpful, and James seems to be a guy who is, who is wired and passionate about taking the complex and making it simple, incredible, making it incredibly practical to our lives, just different biblical characters, and are, are, we, are we pressing something? Yeah, I'm probably pressing something here. I didn't know these characters. All we can see is little bits and pieces in their lives, but it appears as though these men and women were motivated by some kind of passion. Personality. Personality is that God-given traits that shape how you interact with others. Around 460 BC, Hippocrates, like, I don't know, like, Hippocrates suggested that humans had a persona, a personality. So, 460 BC, somebody, behavioral sciences are kind of born. Somebody's looking at people and saying, you know, I see these traits in people. People, you know, people seem to behave in these kinds of ways, right? And so, you probably have heard those phrases choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholy, right? Some 60, 70 years ago, um, other researchers, social behavior scientists come along and, and they, they, they kind of dig deeper into this and, and uh, they develop a profile called the DISC profile. The DISC profile, uh, just the, the, the letters in that profile highlight uh, personality traits. So, so the D in the DISC stands for dominant. They're direct and domineering, and if you think of the Winnie the Pooh characters, this would be Rabbit. Maybe next slide, Steve. Go to the next slide for us here. I, I um, reflects uh, the inspiring personality, enthusiastic, and this would be Tigger, right? And the Winnie the Pooh characters. It would be the Apostle Peter, who's just inspiring, enthusiastic, and getting himself in trouble. Paul being the, uh, the Rabbit, the direct, the domineering kind of personality. S, steady and accommodating. This is Pooh. And this is also Barnabas. Somebody you can count. He's there. He's faithful. Just steady. And then you have conscientious, the C, and analytical. And this would be Piglet and the Dr. Luke who was so into finding all of the details and making sure the details were correct and who it was that Jesus Christ was and how it is that he came about and who, in fact, he really is and how he demonstrated himself to be. God in flesh. Am I pressing? Yeah, I'm probably pressing. But it seems as though these character traits exist. It seems like this is probably something that's true. And if you were to sit down and take a DISC profile, which I encourage you to do, and you can Google that, and you can find all kinds of resources on the internet, and you can take a free profile, you can pay money to do this, but you can identify, am I a D, am I an S, am I an S or a C? Another personality profile thing is uh, the task-oriented, people-oriented thing. Uh, how am I energized? Am I energized by accomplishing tasks that serve people, or am I energized by interacting with people to serve people? Do I like to be behind the scenes or even in, in front, up in front, but doing to serve people? Or do I just like to be with people, to be present with them, and to, to, to be with them in whatever it is that they're going through to serve people? passion, personality. Do you know your passion? Do you know your personality? There are sheets of paper at the end of each aisle. I'm going to ask people who are close to the end of the aisle, bend over, grab them, pass them. I'm going to ask, invite our worship team to come on up too. This is going to be a homework assignment for you to take home this piece of paper, for those of you who are viewing online, the PowerPoint slides are accessible. Um, they're all part of this, along with the directions and what to do. And I encourage you to take some time this week, five minutes, ten minutes, answer these questions. What am I passionate about? It's fascinating. I've done this several times in my life. And my passion keeps coming back to the same thing. I am passionate about the church. 
I am passionate about helping the church be and do what Jesus designed the church to be and do. I am passionate about helping people know who Jesus is and becoming a follower of him and becoming more and more like him. I can't get away from this passion. No matter where I go, this is what I will do. This is what God made me to do. I can't do anything else. It's my passion. And then I've got a personality that goes with it. I am a task-oriented person. I am a D and I interact in my work environments as an ID. I interact out of influencing in my personal work environments, in my most comfortable places. I interact out of my D. If you live in my home, ask any of my kids or my wife, I am the bombastic, bombastic, do it now, kind of, this is what we're going to do. I'm the driver, I'm the let's go get it kind of a person. I can be direct and that can be hurtful. But this is how God made me. It's been with me since I was a little guy. And the same is true for you. Do you know your inmost being? Do you know how it is that God made you? Do you understand that he made you with a purpose? Do you know it? It's key to your satisfaction when you know it and you're living it. Worship team, would you uh, close us with a final song? Please stand with us. I count on one thing. The same God never fails. Will not fail me now. You won't fail. The same God who's never late is working all things out, is working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name.
church go reflective, reflective on how God made you. Spend some time this week thinking about that and considering, am I doing what God made me to do? Am I doing that in the world? Am I doing that in the church? Am I doing what God made me to do? Have a great week.